This is a uh, leadership recall interview uh, for the uh, people who have been important in the leadership of ASHRAE. And uh, uh, today we're interviewing Bill Cohn, the uh, past president of ASHRAE, as to uh, his experience in this industry. I'm Rod Kirkwood. I'm a presidential member of ASHRAE also. And we'll go on from there. You ready, Bill? Let's go, Rod. OK. <clears throat> well, first question is, would you give a brief <clears throat> biographical sketch of your uh, life? Well, uh, it gets less brief all the time. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I was uh, born in the uh, midst of the uh, Great Depression in 1931. Uh, my parents were, uh, neither, of them, neither one had a uh, high school education, so they were having a pretty tough time of it. Uh, they, uh, they were committed, though, uh, to the fact they started uh, impressing upon me when I was very, very young that I was going to go to college. And, uh, and, and they, they were, my dad was an authoritarian, and uh, that meant that I had no uh, option but to be a good student. Uh, so I had an opportunity to get a good private education. Uh, my high school days at a Catholic school, elementary school, my high school days, I was uh, educated by the Jesuits, who probably taught me uh, more that helped me get through life than I learned in engineering school because they taught me logic. And I found that it's very beneficial to my life. Uh, another thing interesting as I was growing up, uh, my, my dad, who I said didn't have a high school uh, education, in uh, the early 1930s, he, uh, he couldn't get a job. Uh, jobs were few and far between, so he, was, he would get jobs doing menial work of different kinds. And he sat back, as an un uneducated guy now, and he said, I have to have a profession. I've got to learn something, and it has to be something new that there's a demand for people. And he, he uh, struck upon air conditioning. And uh, he wrote to a correspondence school in Chicago. Uh, he got a car took a correspondence course, and he studied air conditioning. And then he had the guts to go out and tell uh, the carrier distributor in St. Louis that he knew all about air conditioning and refrigeration, and they hired him on as a serviceman. And, uh, and at that point, he started telling me that I was going to be an air conditioning engineer. So I never made the decision, and <laughs> he made it for me. And, uh, and I guess uh, if you look back, a lot of people come into this industry in a lot of ways, but I grew up in it. I, and I, my first job was uh, helping my dad on a service truck. And uh, when I was in high school, uh, a junior in high school, and at my first year out of high school, I became an apprentice pipe fitter. And I learned on the job. And uh, then I went to Purdue University to study engineering because it just was, it was dictated for me. It was programmed in my mind. And, um, and after a little while, uh, just like a semester, uh, I ran out of money. And that was after World War II. You couldn't get uh, uh, jobs on the campus. So I uh, came back to St. Louis and went to work as a pipe fitter and uh, was trying to take some evening school courses and things of that nature. And a few years went by in the Korean War, and I was drafted. And, uh, and by the time I got out of the Army, uh, I had a wife and a child and uh, the GI Bill. I went back to college at uh, Washington University and uh, finished. Uh, that's how I got my education. And uh, I then went to work in the family air conditioning business. And uh, I, I sold the business in a couple of years because it was contracting and I didn't like contracting. I wanted to be a designer. And uh, went to work for a small consulting engineering firm in St. Louis and I was there the rest of my career. So that's kind of how I got into, a, into the industry <laughs> and, uh, and the career in my lifetime career in air conditioning. That sounds like a good way to start out. It was easy. Yeah. <laughs> Took a lot of work, yeah. but it wasn't hard. <laughs> it, uh, you've done well from there. Okay, the next question I have for you is describe the industry at that time. Uh, well, it was interesting. Uh, it, this now is the late 40s uh, and the early 50s. Uh, most of the air conditioning was add-on, putting uh, air conditioning in theaters and in stores. Uh, uh, very few buildings in the early days of my career were built with air conditioning. And that kind of evolved through the 50s. 
So I w you might say that, uh, that in my career, I came on board when they were just starting to put central air conditioning in buildings, and I've seen it all since, all the change. And uh, amazingly enough, Rod, I, I, I hate to say this, but in many cases, we're not doing as good a job today as we did in the 1950s because we've, we've value engineered the products, we're too much, it's just like the airlines, anything you, once you start working for nothing but cost, you forget what it was you set out to do. So I've seen a lot of changes, but the industry is, uh, it, it has matured, we've seen a lot of changes for the better, and I think if we simply, simply refocus ourselves on what we set out to do, uh, we can do a much better job. That makes good sense. All right, we'll go on from there to the next one. Uh, how and when did you uh, get, s get started in Ashford? Well, um, I wasn't a member of Ashray for many years. Uh, we had a chapter in St. Louis, and uh, it was when I went to work in for the consulting engineer. The guy I was working for, his name was Chuck McClure, and he was the program chairman for uh, for our St. Louis Ashray chapter, and he kind of got me interested in coming to the meetings. Uh, I was at the fir my first Ashray meeting, and I was sitting at the table with a lot of people I knew, and one guy was a manufacturer's rep. And uh, now, if you remember, in the 19, this was the early 60s now, and in the 1950s, I forget the year where we merged the Heating and Ventilating Engineering Society and the, uh, and the uh, Refrigeration Society. Well, we, were, we had a large refrigeration contingent in St. Louis, and, and there was the big kind of the, the fight for turf between these two groups. And I was sitting with uh, some people, and a very good friend of mine, a manufacturer's rep, said, you know, we, these guys, the, these refrigeration guys, they want to take over everything. And I, he said, we ought to just split off from them and have our own group. And I said to him, I said, I'm not going to tell you his name, but I said, you know, I think it's great that we have the refrigeration guys because I think refrigeration is half of what we do. And, and the fact is that the next day I got a, 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 an application. I joined ASHA for the specific purpose of trying to solve that problem. And, uh, and over the years, we developed a very, very harmonious group in St. Louis between refrigeration and the right. air conditioning guys. Well, that's what the industry needed. It, it, More it, people doing yeah. what you did, and we came out all right. Well, and it, and, it, and it also helped me an awful lot because it got me started on another phase of my career that's probably been the greatest thing I ever did. That was joining Ashray. What were your goals when you were president? <coughs> um, let me just proceed. Uh, that with the comment that I observed, I, I worked, fortunately I, I worked very closely with a lot of the presidents of ASHRAE on different issues that were coming up on the days that I was on the, the standing committees, uh, starting with the, uh, the issue that you started in 1973-74, that is Standard 90. Uh, I had a chance to work with a lot of ASHRAE presidents, and the one thing that I saw happening in many cases is that a president would, would come into the office, he would, have a, uh, he would have an objective, he would have a plan, and something would come out of left field and, and give him a blind hit, which would throw him all off course and, he'd, and then he'd, he'd be reacting, trying to solve this problem. So before I took over the job, I tried to understand everything that could possibly happen. <laughs> And I have, a, uh, I have a firm belief in the fact that we really don't have problems in life, we have opportunities. So I took every problem that I thought could possibly give me a blindside hit, and I said, now I want to turn that into some kind of an opportunity to help the society rather than let us side. And I, I've got some notes here. Let me just kind of go through some of the objectives. The one was the handbook initiative. Uh, Jim Wolf. Had, uh, had traveled around the country, visited many, many, many chapters, and he would visit employers and members while he was on this, this, this circuit. And, and it, the, one compl the major complaint that they had, he asked them what they thought good about ASHRAE, what bad, and the major complaint that they had was that our handbooks weren't what they used to be. 
they were losing their relevance. So the one thing I wanted to do was, was get a major initiative to start revising the handbook and turning them into what the people were asking for. Uh, the next one was the Standard 62. The Standard 62 was a big problem in the society because we got, we got proprietary interests outside the society fighting with each other trying to, to manipulate ASHRAE to favor one or the other. And I thought we have to do something to get this all out in the open. And then we have to take advantage of, of these people fighting against either, each other to get input from them so we can develop a better standard. So I, major six, or standard 62 was a major initiative. Uh, uh, I wanted to expand the membership base. Uh, the complaints we hear year after year from engineers, I designed the system to work a certain way and then they have a, a person that doesn't have the background and the experience to operate it, takes it over and doesn't know what to do and things don't work. Uh, and I looked at that problem and I said, why don't we get those people that were, were saying they don't know what to do and teach them what to do. So I wanted to expand our membership base so that we would start including the operators of buildings and the managers of buildings who, who employ those people. Um, uh, energy awareness, of course, uh, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, but the energy awareness, I wanted to to try to to bring the the awareness to the oh, not only the engineering community, but through our outreach programs uh, to the entire engineering community and anyone we relate to, like the architects community, that we've just about used up the energy resources of the earth in 150 years, and we created a very good way of life but it's not going to last much longer. <laughs> and we have, to put, we have to put all our emphasis on trying to, keep, to preserve the quality of life while not using more energy resources or by, by, by reducing the energy resources we need and the energy dependence. So that was a major initiative. Uh, sharing of technology. Uh, traveling the world, we, we, we find that everyone, everywhere in the world is looking for, to America, looking to the United States, for technology, and I, one of my initiatives was, was to try to do a better job of, of the exchange of technology around the world, and that has to do also with the expansion of the uh, ASHRAE membership globally. Uh, uh, the region at large, uh, that was one of my objectives to, to, to bring every ASHRAE member uh, into an ASHRAE region so that they have representative on the board of directors, and we wanted to get, get that done. Uh, uh, and then the ASHRAE outreach. I wanted to, to get ASHRAE aligned with other organizations in, in some sort of partnering agreement so that we could work on, on, uh, on technology advances and other issues that were to both of our benefits. And through that initiative, uh, we, we reached partnering, partnering agreements with the AGA, I, I'm not the, the GSA, the General Services Administration, the largest real estate owner and, and operator in the world, uh, with the International Institute of Refrigeration, IIR, uh, and with uh, the United States Green Building Council, who had really has the interest of the world on energy, but they, uh, they, they don't know anything about the technology, so I thought we could provide. Them. So we have uh, agreements with those three people, and uh, that's probably, those were my initiatives. Those, and, and, I, and I think as I sit here, uh, all of them, uh, I can't say that they were all accomplished, but they were all put in motion. You know, we're, none of us are naive enough to think that you can do all, everything in one year, <laughs> but at least we put some, these things in motion. And, and I feel, I feel day, today as I go in the meeting rooms, I hear people talking about these things, I feel like uh, I probably succeeded in that. Yeah, that's great. Well, let's see. Uh, but more than anybody do them start these things because once they are, the idea is sold, it'll go on on its own with everybody else's help. That's right. Okay. Uh, you think that this is a change in the industry or were there events that changed the industry? Well, the, I, I guess you couldn't go through 19, uh, or through 2001, 02 without talking about an event that changed the industry. And of course, the event is obviously 9-11. Yeah. Uh, 
and that and that I didn't anticipate, Rod. <laughs> so that was one that blindsided me. You weren't me. the only one. <laughs> yeah. uh, it, that blindsided me, and uh, and I was in the same position you were. I was getting ready to head for Naples that day yeah. for the conference over the, for the Riva conference, uh, but uh, I guess the the uh, the reaction to the, that I saw to that was absolutely unbelievable. My email got busy that day. From and I got emails from people all over the world, Eastern Europe, the the uh, the, the Mid East, the Orient, uh, Western Europe, uh, people that that I know or that that knew I was the president of Ashray. Uh, and these were messages of. of Condolences for what's happened in the United States. There were messages of, of uh, comradeship and, and, and offering of help. I, I was absolutely dumbfounded by the outpouring of concern uh, through, through the, our friends in, in the other countries, the Ashray members. And that's when I felt like, uh, uh, like we, we really have something different in Ashray in our globalization. Uh, we don't have, you never see engineers trying to tear things down. Engineers try to build. Mm -hmm. And that's true in any country you go into. Uh, and, and one of the, the, the things that I, 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 I really felt bad about was when uh, this unfortunate incident came up where we were bombing Belgrade. And a very good friend of mine in Ashray was a professor at the University of Belgrade. Mm -hmm. And he and I were communicating daily by email when this was going on. Uh, and, and trying to, to, to us, we wanted to make sure that our friendship was hanging together. And, uh, and, and I think that the, if you say, did 9-11 change ASHRAE? No, it didn't change ASHRAE. It's just, it just brought all the engineers of ASHRAE closer together. And that may change ASHRAE, and that's a positive change. Uh, now, I, it's hard to say anything good came out of 9-11 but I think it really got the engineering community working together globally. And I've, I've noticed since then in traveling overseas, uh, I've never been anywhere as the president of ASHRAE that, that we weren't welcome. Uh, so uh, it was an event that sort of uh, gave us a blindside hit, but I, I have to say that it, uh, it didn't knock us down. Well, that's a, a very positive statement, I think a very, very Beneficial statement for the uh, for the whole world, and not just for for Ashley. Ashley is a, a major factor. I think that's true, Rod. Okay. The next question is, uh, what is Ashley meant to the industry's growth? Well, to the industry's growth, I'd say they probably meant everything. Uh, Ash Ashray seems to me to be the. Uh, the uh, glue that binds it all together. Uh, uh, you, you go to our, our, our product show that we're having here uh, uh, in Anaheim and, and you look at, the, at, at all the products and what we have to do is we, we, have, we buy all those products, put them together and develop systems. Uh, uh, the people that come to that show come to the short courses, uh, they attend our meetings, uh, uh, if it wasn't for ASHRAE, I don't know what would hold the industry together because ASHRAE, is, ASHRAE unlike, say, ARI, who is our, our partner in the show, uh, ASHRAE is in the of, of, of putting those products into systems, whereas ARI is, admittedly, their interest is to sell the products. Now, in our kind of an industry, if you're selling the products, who's going to put in the systems? Uh, who's going to design the systems? And, and uh, I think that without ASHRAE, I, I, I can't envision where our industry would be. But I, I will say this, as I mentioned before, I, I started in this industry when we were just starting to put systems in buildings. And, uh, and, and, and the changes that have taken place in 50 years are absolutely staggering. Uh, and that wouldn't have happened. It would have taken a different course. It would have taken an entirely different. We may have still had package units in drugstores. I don't know, <laughs> but it, uh, I'm sure it couldn't have happened the way it did. And of course, the other thing that ASHRAE does is it gives it a. It, 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 our association with the American Institute of Architects, with the Illuminating Engineering Society, with these other 
or organizations uh, are, are what kind of really weld the design together. And we've been talking for a long time about integrated design, but we're getting closer and closer and closer to it. And it could never happen without a society like ASHRAE. So I think ASHRAE is meant to everything in the industry. Well, one, one other point with ASHRAE did was uh, establish new standards of efficiency required of all the manufacturers. That's Energy true. efficiency. Yeah. And that changed the, the manufacturing of everything, and it continues. We are still increasing the requirements for, for uh, That's right. products that are going to be used in our building. And, and we're right, we are. We're writing the standards, yeah. and the government is looking for, to us to write those standards. And, uh, and it's painful because there's all kinds of differences of opinion out there. But you know, the other, the other fascinating thing, what I mentioned before about problems and opportunities, having these standards provide, pr provides opportunities for the manufacturers to put new products out there on the market, to replace the obsolete ones that are inefficient. So it's, it's turned out to be a win-win situation for everyone. I think it certainly has. Okay, well, let's see, what do we, what haven't we covered? What about, what about people that stand out in your, uh, in your tools? Well, I have to start uh, way, way back, of course, my father. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, as I was growing up, uh, my high school physics teacher had a lot of influence on me. He, he, he developed uh, uh, a trait that I think was absolutely necessary to mention your curiosity. He would develop a lot of curiosity and then show us how you get the answers. Uh, then my, uh, in, when I was in engineering school, his name was Father Preuss, a, a Jesuit. When I was in engineering school, Charlie Kippenhahn was the, uh, uh, and I actually remember, was the uh, chairman of the engineering, the mechanical engineering department. And, uh, and he got me really fascinated in fluids and thermodynamics and heat transfer. And uh, these were all the fields that would help me later on. Uh, we became very good friends and he gave me my first teaching job. Uh, I was just, uh, uh, one semester out of college, and, uh, and, and he was hurting for a thermodynamics teacher, uh, and he called me up and asked me if I'd like to try it, and, uh, and it started me on a whole career of teaching and public speaking and uh, something I'd never done if I hadn't, and the first night I walked into a classroom, I was trembling, <laughs> shaking, <laughs> but I forced myself to do it, and it's, it's, it opened up a whole new window, my, a whole new part of my career. Uh, from that point, I, I have to say that the, uh, Chuck McClure, the engineer I went to work for when I was about 30, uh, he was a, uh, what one of the guys used to call a liberal arts engineer because his, his uh, degree was in physics, not engineering. Uh, but he, uh, he was an innovator and uh, he believed in the energy ethic. In other words, that energy was cheap in those days. But he'd get all over my backside if I used a 10 horsepower motor on a cooling tower when I could have found one with a five. So he, he instilled in me the, the fact that you could always do it with less energy if you think about it. Uh, so he, was, he gave me a lot of, uh, a lot of, of opportunity to be innovative. Uh, he taught me to always be innovative but always have a back door. <laughs> Never paint yourself in a corner. And, uh, and that's kind of helped me through my engineering career. And, and, and the other people that have helped me immensely uh, are the people I've worked with at ASHRAE. I, when I first got on a TC, uh, I thought I, I just kind of died and went to heaven because I met all the leaders of the technology, the guys that developed the, the products that I was using on these TCs. And, uh, 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 and, and then I got on the standing committees and, and I watched the presence of ASHRAE uh, and the president of ASHRAE is a leader. Uh, he really does make a big difference in the society. And I watched some of these presidents uh, take on some very, very difficult tasks. Uh, the, uh, you know, you're running a 55,000 person society and you're always going to find all of a sudden somebody's unhappy about something. <laughs> and, and you can't make light of any of that because everybody's important. And I've, so I, I watched these men and uh, uh, they've had an awful lot to do with my, my career and my life. So I, those are kind of my role models uh, uh, as I went through life. And, uh, and I think I'm a very fortunate guy to have 
had so many good role models. And incidentally, Rod, you happen to be one of them, so <laughs> <laughs> let's keep it all in perspective. <laughs> well, that uh, big point is that you learn from it and you enjoy the process of learning and it has helped in your career, but it helped the industry. It sure has helped my career. What you, yeah. what you helped do for that. But okay, I guess the last item I have on my list here is what advice would you give to a young person entering the, entering the H H HVAC? Uh, well, let me just say that I have given advice to a lot of young people entering the industry because for many years I taught a graduate program in, at Boston University in uh, environmental system design. Uh, and, and I was a thesis advisor to the students of the program and then each of those students, uh, virtually every one of them is working in the industry today. Uh, uh, it's, it's hard to say what advice you would give them not knowing specifically who the student is and what advice they need. But basically I try to, to give them a foundation and, and, and advice in, in staying close to the engineering fundamentals. Never, never design anything because somebody else said it's a good idea. If you don't thoroughly understand it, do something else. Go ahead. Uh, 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 always maintain a curiosity. Never, never take something for granted. Be curious how it works and, and try to relate that to your fundamental engineering knowledge. Uh, uh, don't work for money. Uh, best advice I think I can give a young person is do the kind of work you like to do and the money will come. Uh, young people tend to say, well, I'll go, go into this field because there's more money. Well, the more money, there's more money there today because somebody's desperate. <laughs> There may not be a job there tomorrow. So you go into the career you want to pursue, that you think you'll enjoy, and pursue it aggressively, and you'll always make a good living. And, uh, and I say that uh, uh, as a, uh, with a lot of experience, because when I went to work as a consulting engineer, I was making about half as much money as the other students I graduated with at that time who went into aerospace and, and, uh, and military contracting uh, design companies and so forth. Uh, and uh, as, as time went on, I was really having a ball in my career, and they were usually out looking for a job once or twice, you see. <laughs> so that's, I guess that's about the advice I would have. Well, we thank you very much for your sharing with us and this, and I think that it'll be inspiration to a whole lot of people going along by. Well, Rod, I've enjoyed the opportunity of being able to do it, and uh, I thank you very, very much for giving me the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.